Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Current. Um, the Current is the North Central Region Water Network's speed networking webinar series. Uh, the North Central Region Water Network is a university extension-led collaboration among land-grant universities in 12 upper Midwestern states. My name is Rebecca Power, and I will be your moderator for today. Our webinar today will focus on aquatic invasive species. Um, we will share some examples of extension programming that address aquatic invasive species and also citizen engagement and citizen science uh, that uh, addresses AIS. In the first half of our 60-minute program, we will have five great presenters tell us about their approach to AIS in their states, and then we'll have some time for discussion. So to introduce them uh, briefly, and we'll get into more detail later, Tim Campbell is going to kick us off. Tim is from the University of Wisconsin Extension, UWC Grant, and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Tim wears many hats. Uh, Paul Skowinski and Eric McFarlane are from the University of Wisconsin Extension. They're going to be talking a little bit about Wisconsin's citizen monitoring program for AIS and clean boats and clean waters. Joe Lattimore from Michigan State University is going to talk about Michigan's citizen monitoring program for aquatic invasive species and some lessons learned there. And Eleanor Burkett from the University of Minnesota Extension is going to talk about Minnesota's new AIS detector program. So great lineup for you today. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and toss it right over to Tim Campbell, who is uh, an aquatic invasive species outreach specialist for UW Extension. Sea Grant and DNR, as I mentioned. Uh, he coordinates AIS outreach between all three organizations and works to incorporate regional efforts into local programs, which is what he's going to tell us a little bit about right now. So, Tim, go right ahead. Thanks for the introduction, Rebecca. And I don't want to take up too much time, but I'd like to give everyone just a, a quick overview of what our aquatic invasive species uh, working group looks like. And our working group started with a seed grant from the North Central Region Water Network. So thank you, North Central, North Central Region Water Network. Um, it really provided uh, some initial resources to help get us together uh, and start the conversation on you know, what we might all like to work together on. And what we're really hoping that our working group does is increase collaboration among aquatic invasive species professionals, which there are at least a few of uh, within extension uh, within the North Central Region Water Network, but also you know, extension folks that are just interested in aquatic invasive species or where aquatic invasive species may just intersect a part of their program. We'd really like to welcome those folks in as well because I think um, you know, instead of recreating the wheel for certain programming uh, efforts, that you might be able to look to our working group to figure out ways that already exist to help address problems that uh, you may be having. And hopefully we can, you know, as a network, uh, share programming resources, learn from each other, and you know, see what might be applicable in multiple states if something's already created. And with our seed grant, uh, as a working group, we were able to attend uh, the Upper Midwest Invasive Species Conference, which was held in La Crosse, Wisconsin in October. And that gave us a chance to go all get on the same page on kind of the current science of uh, invasive species, especially in the uh, Upper Midwest, and then also try to identify some items or some you know, programs that we're all interested in. And moving forward as a working group, uh, we plan on filling out um, kind of a programming and resources spreadsheet. So we all have a really good idea of what things we're working on across the North Central Region Water Network. And if there's things that interest us, maybe we can explore at or explore uh, applying those all together. Um, let me see. I'm trying to read my notes here. Uh, my handwriting is getting, getting worse and worse. Uh, oh, we look to have a, uh, a webinar series for workshopping some of our programs. And we hope to have a, a nice, tight working group so that way um, if we have new ideas or programs that are just getting off the ground, we can get together, talk about them, um, and just to try to help each other out in making our programs the best they can be. And you know, right now it seems like our current interest, as you can see by the webinar program, is in citizen monitoring and citizen science. Um, and hopefully, at least in our first couple of months, uh, we can really you know, 
focus on that and try to make our programs uh, the best they can be. So at that, Rebecca, I'll get it back to you and we can start hearing more about these great programs. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And to Joe for providing leadership for this North Central Region Water Network sub-hub. Um, and we will also um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end uh, where, where you all, uh, participants here, will be able to submit your questions for all of our presenters uh, in the chat box uh, at the lower left-hand portion of your screen. Um, and we can take questions about any of the programs as well as potential opportunities to participate in the team that Tim was talking about. So uh, with that, let's move on to Paul Squinsky and Eric McFarlane. Er Eric, Aaron McFarlane. I'm seeing all these C's here. And uh, I'm not going to read their introductions, but just to say um, that they are both from UW Extension, the Lakes program, and are going to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, some of UW Extension's activities in aquatic invasive species and the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program here in Wisconsin. So go ahead. Yeah, it looks like I have control, but Aaron should be up first. You both have control. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I will see how I advance slides, and I can start out then. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to be... Okay, perfect. I've not done Blackboard before, so I apologize for the learning curve. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm Aaron McFarland. And I help coordinate the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program for Wisconsin. Um, and it is Wisconsin's watercraft inspection program. So, and probably a few to me slides for five minutes. I'm going to try to give you all an overview, and I'll look forward to answering questions that you have about the program. Um, so, some of you may be familiar with uh, watercraft inspection programs um, in other states, but um, really our goal um, for our our state program is to engage citizens um, and get them to take action in their local community regarding aquatic invasive species uh, prevention and outreach. Uh, the Clean Boats, Clean Waters program started in 2004 and really it began as a grassroots effort uh, in northern Wisconsin and the Minocqua area. And it looks like the picture is a little messed up there at the bottom, but what you're looking at there are the three students that um, really started this program they noticed that there was an aquatic plant in the local lake that was really kind of building these mats across the lake and causing some problems for boating and enjoying the lake, and they wanted to learn more about it. Discovered it was Eurasian water milfoil, and um, that grew from there, and they decided the best way to share with people what Eurasian water milfoil was, an aquatic invasive species, and how it was spread by boaters, would be to stand at the boat landing and talk with people. Um, they were they uh, called themselves the milfoil, milfoil masters. You can't read that on their shirt. And then in 2004, the state adopted the program, naming it Clean Boats, Clean Waters. So it's kind of a cool beginning for the state's program. Um, just in short, what a inspections actually consist of, well, primary, our goal is to um, engage and educate the boaters and anglers that visit the boat landing on what are aquatic invasive species if they're not familiar and how are they spread. Um, we encourage the inspectors to have an engaging conversation, and we'll look at a data sheet in a little bit that shows you how, to, to, how they do that. Um, and then the, the last part, which is um, probably the less important part to our citizens, but more important to our statewide program, is the collecting and um, then reporting of data while they're at the boat landing. And like I said, we'll look at that data sheet in just a minute. So you're probably all aware of how to prevent aquatic invasive species, but just to show you, these are the steps that we ask our inspectors to share when they're at the boat landing. Um, we try to be very consistent and always ask them to share this information um, with the people who are uh, fishing and boating, and they'll share specific steps with um, boaters and anglers depending on what activity they're doing. Um, so just to kind of give an example, here's the data sheet that our inspectors use, and it's a little distorted on the screen. Sorry about that. For some reason, all the slides are distorted here. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea. It's a pretty basic data sheet across the top there. They put their information in, and then each line would be reflected um, for a boater that they, or angler that they talk to. 
Um, really the most important part of the data sheet is that block in the middle that talks about discussing prevention steps. You'll notice it's not really a section where they record any data. It's really just there to guide them through their conversation. And that's one of the most important parts of doing inspections is we really would like them to engage boaters and anglers in a conversation instead of just um, instructing them about what our aquatic invasive species prevention steps or regulations are that's actually engage them and ask them some questions and hopefully they can uh, understand and help answer any questions that boaters or anglers might have. Um, and you'll notice in that section, too, when our inspectors talk to someone who's simply out boating, they'll cover specific prevention steps through draining their water, but if they are, all, are, are also fishing, then they'll also go into draining water from live wells, ensure the live bait laws. These sheets um, also are entered into a statewide beta, database called SWIMS, the Surface Water Integrated Monitoring System. And so we're able to see um, totals across the state, um, totals within counties, and uh, even more beyond that to specific projects on a specific lake. So just to give you a general idea of what 2016 was like for us, um, we've been very fortunate to see over 100,000 boats inspected um, for quite a few years now, and that's one of our uh, goals is to keep it above that number. Um, we have a pretty impressive number of people contacted, too. So you'll notice that really the data that our inspectors report is how many people they've talked to, the hours they've spent, the boats inspected. But we all are also curious about um, what boaters and anglers are reporting as far as the actions they take. Are they actually taking these prevention steps at the boat landing? Um, and that is the secondary study that we have regarding that that our staff across the state participate in, the Clean Boats, Clean Waters Boater Behavior Study. Um, and it's a stratified random sample study. Uh, we uh, hopefully, we've been doing this study for, gosh, this might be our third or fourth year now. And we're hoping by um, being more strategic in where we have the study take place, we can get more accurate data and get a better idea about what actions um, voters are actually taking. It's still self-reported data, so, you know, there's going to be some bias there. But it's very helpful for reporting back to the legislature um, about what Wisconsin's Clean Wolves, Clean Waters program is achieving and, and the whole point. And lastly, um, just in case any of you guys are wondering, like, why do we do watercraft inspection, um, it is still the most cost-effective um, prevention tool that we have. Um, and uh, some of us uh, agree more about it being a good containment tool, but it is very effective at keeping aquatic invasive species where they are. But of course, you always want to um, prevent them um, from arriving into a lake as well. There's been studies about the effectiveness of just having the visual inspections, um, and that's what the, the second bullet kind of refers to one of the studies that the Nature Conservancy um, did. Um, and it also really helps our uh, local lake citizens feel like they can take ownership of the program and take action on their lake. Um, I, know for, I never think it's a bad thing to actually get folks engaged and um, in active locally. So I'll be happy to take questions later, I think. Um, so thanks. All right, thanks, Aaron. So again, this is Paul Skowinski. I'm the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network Coordinator for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, in 2008, we launched an aquatic invasive species monitoring component of the network, and this was relying primarily on county-level EIS coordinators. So we have several statewide staff, including Tim Campbell, who you heard from before, uh, Jenny Seifert. They do a lot of the communications work related to AIS. We have an AIS monitoring lead at the DNR, and then we have uh, Aaron and myself coordinating the volunteer AIS programs for the state. But a lot of the on-the-ground work related to volunteer AIS monitoring is actually coordinated by county-level or regional-level AIS coordinators in the state. Um, in 2010, there was a big initiative statewide to push for lots of volunteers to be involved in AIS monitoring. And we reached uh, almost 350 volunteers that were out monitoring and recording data. So there was probably a higher number than that that were actually doing the monitoring. We always have more that are actually monitoring than the ones that are um, entering the data in the database. 
So a question that we we had when we look at the graph here is what happened after 2010? There was clearly a decline in interest in AIS monitoring, and we were wondering why is that? So we decided to just ask the volunteers themselves what they feel is limiting volunteer involvement in AIS monitoring. And uh, nearly 45% of people said that they don't think AIS monitoring data would result in changes to management actions. In other words, if I find zebra mussels in my lake and I report it in the database, is anything going to be different next year? Um, they, they question whether that's the case or not. Um, also, there, there's clearly a, a big three here. With nearly 41% said that AIS monitoring is too difficult or the training that we provide is inadequate to give volunteers the confidence they need to detect and identify AIS. Um, and then many of them also felt that AIS monitoring simply takes too much time. Um, many of our lake residents are seasonal residents. They often come up to the lake on weekends. Um, they don't want to spend a lot of their weekend volunteering or working. So we also heard that people feel that if they already have an invasive species or more than one, they don't feel a need to monitor the lake because they're already infected. And about 15% said they don't have a boat, so they can't monitor um, effectively. So to tackle a couple of these issues, we decided that we were going to do away with the over 300-page manual that had, had been used for quite a while. Uh, and split this into two documents. So one of them was going to be a very small, easy to read color document that we're calling the Early Detector Handbook. And this is uh, basically finished now. It'll be going to print soon. So this will be uh, something new for the 2017 season. And this is very simple. It can You can read through the entire thing in under 10 minutes. It's full of color photographs. And it's mostly an identification guide but also contains things like the monitoring protocols. Um, if anyone wants to learn a lot of real detailed information about an individual species, then they would turn to a second document, which is probably going to be um, 80 or 100 pages still, but it will be this optional thing that's not really going to be required by any of the volunteers, but it'll be there as a resource if they'd like to learn more. And we also started offering the Wisconsin DNR aquatic plant training workshops to CLMN volunteers, as well as DNR staff, county staff, uh, tribal staff, the people who uh, typically have attended that session. We opened this up starting last year, and we saw that um, probably 20 to 25 percent of the participants we had in those workshops were actually citizen volunteers. So it was fantastic to see the interest on their part, and we'll continue to offer that to them to help increase that confidence in identifying AIS. Uh, this is just a, a sample page from within the new handbook, so you can get an idea of, of what's inside. And then as far as needing a boat, uh, previously we, we never really had any solid protocols in the old manual. It was more guidance. It would, it would suggest if you want to look for Eurasian milfoil, this is a place that you might want to look, and this is a time that you might want to look. Uh, I didn't really have a, a protocol that we could use to standardize the effort between volunteers. So right now, there will be two protocols starting this season. One of them will be a, a boat meander survey, and one will be a shoreline or public access protocol. So if you don't have a boat, you can still use that. And this will be uh, applicable to all species. It will not be species specific. As far as AIS monitoring taking too much time, uh, something that we thought of this year is why not explore the idea of a one-day AIS monitoring event? The River Alliance of Wisconsin has done this for a few years with bridges on, on, uh, at stream crossings, and they've had great success getting participants to uh, help with that effort. So we're going to expand that to not only bridge crossings, but also boat landings and public access points this year. And we're partnering with Minnesota as well. So Eleanor, who we'll talk later, uh, is, is partnering with us to do the same thing in Minnesota on the same day. So it will be August 5th, and it will be rivers and lakes in both Wisconsin and Minnesota. 
So we're excited to see how that goes, and this will be using the new shoreline protocol from the manual. Uh, another potential obstacle we, we saw is that in the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network here in Wisconsin, we have covered the costs of pretty much every kind of um, volunteer monitoring. Sorry for my phone ringing in the background. Um, the only thing that we haven't covered is the AIS monitoring. So maybe we could eliminate that cost if the cost itself is an obstacle to doing that type of monitoring. So we plan to be able to provide all the essential equipment and the training for free starting in 2017. Uh, the only exception will be that optional uh, manual, which may still have a cost to it. It will be available for free online, but if someone wanted a hard copy, there may be a fee associated with that. So this season, uh, the hands-on workshop will be provided at no cost, and either the local AIS coordinator or uh, CLMN staff would handle that training, and that's typically a two to three hour time block. Uh, we will provide an early detector handbook, some basic equipment like Ziploc bags and waterproof labels to collect any suspicious specimens, and then uh, a ruler, a pencil, and a hand lens to aid in identification. So. Uh, that's it for me. I think I'm a little bit over time, but uh, like Aaron, we'll be happy to entertain questions at the end. Great. Thank you, Paul and Aaron. Uh, and now we will move on to Joe Lattimore, and as uh, Paul said, we'll take questions uh, in the second half of our webinar. Uh, please, uh, folks are already putting questions in the in the chat box, so please, uh, for the rest of our participants, feel free to do the same. And uh, Joe Lattimore, again, is from uh, Michigan State University and Michigan State University Extension, and she works uh, also with the Michigan Lake and Streams Associations to promote understanding and stewardship of aquatic resources and aquatic invasive species. So thanks, Joe, and take it away. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm excited to share some of the lessons that we've learned in Michigan as we've developed and expanded our uh, what we call our Exotic Aquatic Plant Watch, which is our volunteer program for monitoring for aquatic invasive plants. And first I want to acknowledge my colleague and co-author Angela De Palma Dow, who I think is on, on the call today. Um, she and I have worked uh, over the last several years to expand uh, this really important program uh, for, our, uh, for our state. And uh, with the help of a new extension educator, Eric Elgin, who I think is also on the line, and uh, also comment that in Michigan we've uh, definitely taken inspiration from our colleagues in other uh, Great Lakes states, uh, particularly Wisconsin. You'll see some uh, similarities between the programs, and we've even adopted a Clean Boats, Clean Waters program, and I know my colleague uh, Beth Clausen with MSU Extension who leads up our Clean Boats, Clean Waters program here in Michigan is also on the line. Um, you know, we, we uh, work with a lot of uh, organizations to conduct our volunteer lake monitoring program in Michigan, um, and it's headed up by our Department of Environmental Quality, and we've been fortunate enough to have great partners there at the state level, um, and we're able to access some funds uh, from selling some really cool Protect Your Waters Michigan license plates uh, that help fund our ability to expand this program. So the need, uh, we've covered this already, uh, you know, that uh, invasive plants are causing a lot of unwanted damage to our, uh, our inland waters. And we know that catching them early is the best way to get ahead of them and um, before they're able to spread and cause serious ecological and economic damage. And we also knew that um, our volunteers with our program, we've been doing lake monitoring in Michigan with volunteers since 1974, and we knew that they were very interested and concerned about invasive plants in their inland lakes, and so we wanted to respond to that need. So we initially uh, launched a pilot version of this invasive species uh, program in 2007, and we spent a few years in pilot mode, and part of that reason was that uh, we had uh, a lot of people coming to training. Um, they'd, they'd learned how to do other water quality parameters, and then they'd come to our invasive plant uh, identification training and learn them. Uh, There's a lot of curiosity in learning about what these invasive plants look like. Um, but when it comes to actually signing up for doing some surveys and monitoring, we were getting really low response. Um, to give you an example, in 2007, 
we had about 230 lakes monitoring water quality, and only two signed up to actually do the exotic aquatic plant watch. So we knew we had a, a, a uphill battle uh, as far as getting more lakes involved. Um, I'll spend a minute showing you the protocol, which hasn't changed over time. Um, we basically uh, ask our volunteers to uh, tour around the lake in their boats and use rake tosses, throwing a rake head attached to a rope, uh, drag along the bottom of the lake to look for and collect plants and look for uh, particular aquatic invasive species. Um, we definitely have them highlight boating access points, um, inlets, little streams coming into the lake, beaches and parks, places where the risk of introduction of new invasive plants is the highest. And we have them focus on a limited number of species. Um, we started out with uh, Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, um, both of which were already fairly prevalent in Michigan's inland lakes, especially in the southern part of the state. And also hydrilla, which to this day has not yet been found in Michigan, uh, but is certainly a species of, of concern, kind of a super weed. Um, and more recently, we added starry stonewort, uh, a plant that we're having a lot of trouble with here in Michigan and has been spreading throughout uh, the Great Lakes region. So we weren't trying to overwhelm our uh, lakes uh, volunteers with too many species to look at, and that didn't seem to be one of the issues. What our, what our real issues were, were, as I mentioned before, low enrollment. Um, when we finally launched the program to be a full part of the, uh, our monitoring program, which was in 2011, we were up to 26 lakes out of the 221 lakes overall that were volunteering. Um, so we had 12% enrollment, but we still wanted to see that grow higher. And another challenge was that of those lakes that were enrolled, only a small portion, less than 40%, actually followed through and reported their results, actually conducted a survey and reported it. So that was another challenge we faced. So we wanted to go and find out what's going on, what, what insight could we get. So we uh, took a number of approaches. We did paper surveys of our volunteers. We went out on lakes with our volunteers, out on the boat with them, so we could provide some additional training, but also so we could discuss challenges that they were facing. We could observe them in action to see what they seemed to be struggling with, if anything. And we also did a national review um, using phone interviews of invasive species volunteer monitoring programs. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that people were aware of the program, but much like Wisconsin, what Paula told us about just a minute ago, um, a lot of our volunteers didn't see the value of it. They may have already hired a, a professional lake management company to manage invasive species, or they didn't feel confident. They didn't feel confident they could correctly identify the species. They didn't feel confident they could find the time to actually go out and survey. So we address those issues and things like a new brochure about the program, doing blog posts on our website. We even put together recently a YouTube video that talks about the value of doing this monitoring and gives an overview of identifying those important species. We made lake visits. We sent staff out, uh, typically ourselves, out onto these lakes to work with the volunteers to provide them, um, especially on lakes that were new to the program, to provide them some hands-on experience and build that confidence that they, they really can identify these plants and, and feel confident promoting and, and reporting what they were finding. We improved the identification support through materials as well. On the left, you can see an example of a photography sheet that we made, a very simple laminated sheet with a, with a scale on one side so people could take photos, digital photos of the plants they saw. They could send them to us, often digitally, often right from the boat on their uh, smartphone, and we could respond to them with identification help. We also produced through MSU Extension a uh, identification guide to selective in invasive plants that became an invaluable resource for our volunteers. Something we noticed is that a lot of our volunteers if they didn't find any invasive species, they didn't report at all. They didn't let us know that they didn't find anything. And that's really important. If there's no invasives in your lake, that's, that's important news. So we added a place, just a very simple thing. We added a box on the data form asking them to report, check this box if you didn't find anything. And that was really important and actually increased our reporting rate quite a bit. And then finally, we've really been supporting teamwork. A lot of people, a lot of our volunteers initially were trying to do this on their own. Not only is that a safety concern, but it's also a, a lot of work to go out, drive the boat around, rake, look for plants, feel confident you're identifying them correctly. So we added training on building teamwork, 
finding people in your community that might want to help out um, and that you could compare your answers. Okay, do you think this is your Asian milfoil? I'm not sure. Um, that has, has definitely contributed. And we see a lot more teams of people doing these surveys than one or even two people anymore. So what were our outcomes from these changes that we've uh, put into place over the last three or four years? Um, first of all, we have seen some increase, modest increase in enrollment. Um, you can see 2011 is the first year on this chart. Um, the dark blue bars are showing you the total enrollment for each individual year. The more silvery, paler bars are showing that accumulation of new lakes to the program. Because every year we have some lakes that do this every year, but we also have lakes that have never done it before. And so we continue to add new lakes every year, which we're really excited about. Some lakes may take a break, take a year or two off, then come back into the program again. So we're happy to see that um, continue to grow. So overall, since 2011, we're about 78 new lakes that have um, enrolled in this program and reported data, which is great. And maybe the best result, the result that gets me most excited is what you can see on this second chart. And I promise this is my last data chart. What we're looking at here is, again, the number of lakes enrolled each year is the total height of each bar. And then that percentage that you see is the percentage of all the lakes that signed up, how many of them actually reported data. Back in 2011, it was less than half. So we were really, you know, concerned about that. We we're training these people, people were signing up, committing to doing it, and then not doing it. And there's always going to be some volunteers that have, you know, life happens and they're not going to be able to do it. But we wanted to get higher than that. We were aiming for something higher than 50% for sure. So with this additional support, and we really think these lake visits where we go out in the field with the new volunteers and give them some hands-on training and experience and confidence building has really made a difference. And as of 2015, we're up to 79% of the enrolled lakes were actually reporting something to us, which is great. Um, that, the quality of the data is incredibly valuable. And we're looking at, we're, we're still tallying the data from this past season, but it's looking like we'll be maybe a little bit lower than last year, but still above 70%, which we're really pleased about that. So what's next? Um, future directions, we'll be working with um, programmers to incorporate uh, our volunteer program directly into the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network, or MISSIN, which is um, an, an app-based program, web-based program, where uh, data can be entered right away, um, rather than us waiting to get data forms back at the end of the season. Um, early detection doesn't work well if you're waiting months to get the results from your volunteers. And then also we want to emphasize monitoring on lakes that have not been invaded yet. A lot of those are in northern Michigan, we want to make sure that those lakes that are still in the protection phase are out there and detecting things early. So that will wrap up my presentation of what we're doing. I've got a slide there showing some contact information, but of course I'll welcome questions from the chat box at the end. Excellent, Joe. Thank you so much. Right, right on time. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, to Eleanor, and thanks all so much for all these great questions that are coming into the chat. We are keeping track of them uh, for after we hear from Eleanor. So Eleanor Burkett, University of Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Program Extension Educator. Uh, and she's done a lot of work with the University of Minnesota over the years. This is her most recent, uh, recent endeavor. So tell us about what you're doing in Minnesota, Eleanor. Thank you, Rebecca. So yes, I'm working on developing an aquatic invasive species um, detecting program, and I want to um, acknowledge people with that as well. I want to acknowledge Megan Weber, who's an extension educator, Dan Larkin, who's an extension specialist, and Faye Sleeper, the, a program leader who are kind of the core team who are developing that, as well as MACERC staff. Um, the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center staff, and particularly Christine Lee, Becca Nash, Sue Galatowicz, and Nick Feltz, who have all been um, working with this program and supporting it. So, <coughs> excuse me, we're developing a program in Minnesota. We're just getting started, so I'm not going to be having data to show like Paul and Joe have, and, but um, I've been learning from them, and um, it's been great in being part of this network because we've been sharing information, which has been really helpful in starting a new program. So this is um, uh, using citizen science to advance AIS response in Minnesota. And what we're doing is we're training observers to respond, detect, and report aquatic invasive species in Minnesota. And I'll show you some of the tools we're doing for that. 
So basically, it's kind of similar where we're developing a network of trained citizens. We're doing it maybe a little bit differently than some of the other folks are. We're offering a core course that has an online training. So people were using the Moodle system of training. So people can take that training um, on their own time and in their comfort of their home. And um, we have a lot of people in Minnesota who go other places for the winter. So um, they could be taking the training wherever they are. Or if they have a home in the cities and their cabin is up north or something, they could be taking the, tra um, the online training anywhere. Um, that's going to take about six to eight hours for people to take. Plus, we have an in-person workshop. And so once they've completed the online training, um, they can attend the in-person workshop, which is really going to focus and hone in on advancing people's skills in identification, as well as using the tools for reporting. And we even have some pieces in developing communication skills for working with the public. We also have opportunities for advanced learning. So we're going to be having um, lake survey training and, and other advanced courses um, for people to take, as well as annual refreshers. And it is required that um, aqu certified aquatic invasive species invasive species detectors do take annual um, training um, educational hours of up to eight hours per year. So they are going to respond to aquatic invasive species sightings. In Minnesota, we've, um, the Department of Natural Resources has a new reporting app using the EdMaps um, Midwest or Gledden app, Great, what, Great Lakes Early Detection Network. And so people can report through that. And um, AIS detectors may be responding to that, helping the DNR to weed out false positives so that they can be focusing on um, um, responding to detection and new detections. AIS detectors will also conduct new detection surveys. And that's kind of like in somewhat like what Paul talked about with the um, bio blitz uh, that he talked about um, in August. Um, that would be um, somewhat like a new detection survey. So they'd be able to participate in that as well. And we'll be looking throughout the state of Minnesota for aquatic invasive species all in one day. And then they can assist with other aquatic invasive species outreach and research projects with the DNR and the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. And they might be staffing booths or um, other things they could be doing is you know, talking with their neighbors or giving um, programs on aquatic invasive species. So the target species that we're going to focus on will have three plants, Eurasian water milfoil, hydrilla, and starry stonewort. Um, we do not have hydrilla in the state of Minnesota yet, but it is one we have high concern of. Um, so we're going to be teaching people to be on the watch for that. And starry stonewort is a fairly new detection in our state. Two years ago, it was first detected in, um, in one lake. And then in 2016, we found it in seven more lakes in a very short period of time. So we think that there's probably more starry stonewort out there. So we're going to be on the lookout for that. We're also training people for looking for invertebrates, including spiny water flea, rusty crayfish, zebra, and quagga mussels. And so we have a specific trainings for that. And fish uh, include silver carp, big head carp, rough, and round goby. So our training will be focusing on these species and their lookalikes and helping people to distinguish with, with that. In the um, training materials, they will be receiving an aquatic invasive species manual plus an AIS detector um, ID guidebook that they can take out on the field with them. It'll be um, made of waterproof paper. So again, they need to complete the core course. And we have a competency exam. Um, on the materials, it's an open book exam. And people are required to complete that or um, pass that for up to 75%, 70% um, correct. We're also going to have a uh, requirement of 24 five hours of volunteer time annually is going to be required. And it can be achieved through doing those activities I spoke of earlier 
from doing detection work, lake surveys, and outreach. Also, um, as I mentioned before, we'll have eight hours of refresher or advanced training required annually, and that's to help people keep people up to date. Um, let's see here. I had forgotten how to advance it. So some of the new skills they're going to be learning in the um, course is that we'll have some general aquatic ecology and talk um, so that they can learn and understand the plant and um, ecology for plants and the critters that we'll be looking at, as well as talking about the aquatic invasive species in Minnesota and what the um, what we're concerned about and why we chose the plants we cho and, and species we chose. And then again, it'll be focusing greatly on the identification of aquatic invasive species and their lookalikes. We have a unit on rules and regulations, um, which includes um, um, rules that they will follow as volunteers, and also then uh, information on reporting aquatic invasive species. So some of the new skills that they'll learn in the advanced training will be um, aquatic invasive species on the water. We'll have AIS biology and habitat issues, emerging AIS threats, so other species of concern that are not currently in Minnesota, and then the new detection survey. So we're um, developing that as we're, and we're developing new dete um, detect lake detection survey protocols. So I mentioned before that we'll be using the um, EdMaps Midwest or the Gledden app, Great Lakes Early Detection Network, um, as volunteer. So the, uh, even when they sign up, as they sign up, they'll be able to click on um, whether or not they're an, aqua um, an AIS detector when they're building their profile in this, which is really neat. And they'll be making reports or following up reports and working closely with the Department of Natural Resources, as well as bringing um, samples to the DNR um, aquatic invasive species specialists. <coughs> so the benefits in Minnesota that you know we have um, you know over um, about 12,000 lakes in Minnesota that are 10 acres or more, and um, over 6,500 um, rivers and streams, and 10.6 million acres of wetlands, and over 13 billion acres of surface water. And in the state, we have 13 DNR AIS specialists, so that's a lot of land for them to cover. So um, this will be helping them in especially weeding out the false positives, false negatives, excuse me, and um, helping with doing the early, early detection. Um, the funding is through the Minnesota Environmental Trust Fund, and I just put some um, for more information. This is our new website that we are just getting ready to go, and we'll have um, we'll be opening soon for registration for the online classes. Our goal is to start the online courses in March, and then we'll be teaching the six um, field or er, in-person workshops starting in April. So um, it's a pretty ambitious schedule for the year, but we're hoping to be able to get a lot of people on board and um, work hard to retain volunteers. And um, hopefully we can help provide support and keep them going. So um, you may contact me if you have more questions. Excellent, Eleanor. Thank you so much. Really exciting to see the program getting up and running in Minnesota. Uh, let's go uh, lo go back and start addressing some of the great questions that we have in the chat box. And remember, if you also have questions that you haven't yet submitted, please go ahead and do so. Um, Lois Wilson had a question for Erin. Uh, how do you determine which lakes to visit for the watercraft inspections? Yeah. Um, hi, Lois. Thanks for the question. Well. One of the things we always advise the citizens who are already interested in doing inspections is to visit their high traffic landings um, and lakes that have one or more aquatic invasive species, the ones that we like to focus on. Um, however, the majority of our data is collected by citizens. And so that means wherever they live and wherever they want to collect data. Um, 
that's where it's collected. Um, most of them are funded by Department of Natural Resources Aquatic Invasive Species Grant, um, and so they're doing this this work um, with help um, and funding from the grant. But for our our data that's collected by our staff around the state, um, our boat landings are randomly selected since it's a stratified random sample. So within a certain um, region of the state, we divided this data up into I think 11 different regions. Um, we randomly select a boat landing for them to collect data at. Um, so in, in our in our program, we um, for the majority of our inspections that are focused on just engaging and educating citizens about prevention, um, we don't so much strategically pick where inspections take place. We're led more by where the citizens um, live and where they want to inspect. Great. Thanks, Erin. Um, and then uh, Brooke, who looks like she's in Ontario, because she says Ontario is colder than Minnesota, uh, Brooke asks, Erin, she said, you may have touched on this, but how do you go about recruiting volunteers for clean boats, clean waters? Yeah, and I did not touch on it. Um, I was trying to rush through my information. But yeah, great question. You know, this is another um, sort of unique situation for us here in Wisconsin. We're very fortunate to have a lot of eager citizens. And so um, we don't always have to do a lot of recruiting um, to find our clean boats, clean waters inspectors because most of them are funded through grant projects. Um, in certain counties, we are uh, lucky to have some, some regional and county-based AIS staff. We call them our AIS county coordinators. And so a lot of times, if there's specific lakes um, or if they need some more activity in clean boats, clean waters, they'll send out press releases, they'll offer um, advertise the trainings um, and just maybe just do an education session first about what is clean boats before they try to offer a training. Um, so a lot of the recruitment that does take place um, happens to more of a local level, but in a lot of cases um, in, in certain locations of the state we're just trying to keep up with the demand for the trainings um, that arise because of the grants that are awarded. Tough problem to have. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and maybe this relates to a question that I had for Paul. You know, when Paul, you talked about now you're trying to provide the equipment and, and training for free. Um, who's in, how are you able to do that, uh, provide funding and equipment, or uh, equipment and training for free? Who's, who's, who's paying? Sure. The, the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network is supported by the DNR, so the, the cost for our water chemistry analyses and all the equipment that we provide for the various types of monitoring, um, everything is covered by a, a DNR contract. So we do have a limited amount of funds. We just have to be efficient enough to prioritize what we're going to be providing to the citizens. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Janice has a question also for Paul. Did you consider the development of an app instead of a printed book for training materials? We did. Uh, something that we hear often from our volunteers is that they, they don't have um, a lot of technology. Many of them are in northern Wisconsin where they may not have internet. Um, we hear from some of the volunteers that they don't even have a computer. Um, and often they don't have smartphones, so we didn't want to leave too many people out by creating an electronic format. Uh, it's something that we could still consider in the future as a supplemental um, material, but I didn't want to just exclusively do an app. Great. Thank you, Paul. And Lois has a question for Joe. So in addition to, you know, the rough duty of getting out in your boat to look for aquatic invasive species. Um, uh, Lois asks, do you think some, time of friendly some kind of friendly competition between lakes, um, making it uh, more fun uh, for reporting, would help increase uh, participation? I, I like that idea. I think that there is some, uh, some uh, value to it. Um, I know that our volunteers do like some kind of incentive or reward of some kind and, and being known as, as a lake that follows through and, and does the work could be, a, could be one kind of uh, uh, encouragement for our volunteers to engage. I know in our water quality monitoring, we have a drawing every year for those who enter their own data into the online database rather than um, 
waiting for staff on our program to do it, uh, they get entered into a drawing for a free enrollment in that parameter for the next year because we actually do charge a, lot, a nominal fee for each one. Um, and that really increased the number of lakes that entered their own data. So um, having a competition, and especially once we start um, offering the kind of instant data entry through our MISSIN um, a web app, um, people could see more in real time which lakes had already reported some results, um, even if it was I didn't find any invasives, and so they could see kind of where they uh, um, are ranking as far as getting the work done compared to some of the other lakes. So yeah, I'll definitely, I'll think about that a little bit more. And, and Joe, um, Tim is commenting on the digital identification help. He doesn't have a particular question, but um, is there anything more you want to say right now about how how this is done that you think might help your help your colleagues listening today? Sure. So beyond um, actually engaging uh, digital photography into this, it's a fairly low tech process at this point. Um, basically, in their procedures, the volunteers have our email addresses, and if they find a plant that they're not sure of or just want uh, to a double a second opinion on, um, they have these laminated sheets uh, on the boat with them, and they can uh, shoot us photos uh, over email, and we can respond uh, to them. Uh, and what we see. And so there has been cases where, um, you know, a volunteer is out in the lake and we just happen to be by our, by our email and we can respond while they're still out in the field. Um, you know, now that, again, working with more of a, an online interface for the program, we may be able to automate that a little bit more and have just one place where people could upload photos and ask for confirmation, maybe something more like an iNaturalist app or something like that where the, the uh, you know, a person who submits information could ask uh, the community for help in in con confirming or denying their identification. Great, excellent. Um, for all, pre I had a question for all presenters uh, in a number of different areas across the North Central Region Water Network, and in training on uh, related to agriculture, training related to natural resources. We have these conversations about online training versus face-to-face -face or in-person in the field training, and I'm just wondering. Um, if any of you wanted to comment on the use of online training as a component um, to complement in, in the in-person training that you're doing or how those things, how you see those things fitting together. So one of the things that we've done here in Wisconsin uh, in response to the relatively new Starry Stonewort uh, infestation in Wisconsin, when it showed up in 2014, we quickly made an identification video for starry stonewort to compare it to various native species that look similar to it. Um, and this would be something that could be shown at, at town hall meetings, which were going on. There were a lot of local meetings going on in response to this. Um, and it's something that we felt would be very useful. We also are exploring the idea of using other YouTube videos or possibly extensions, a WISMOP model um, for online programming. So we may have some sort of uh, an online instructional program as well. And this is Erin, just to add on to what uh, Paul said for Wisconsin, for our clean, clean waters trainings, we already have some online videos just that show different scenarios of an inspector talking to a boater or angler about um, a certain situation and the prevention steps. And so we found that to be, or at least I, I've heard from citizens, they find that to be pretty useful as a supplement to the training. Um, but there's a lot more that we could do to offer more online training opportunities for clean boats. Here in Michigan, I would comment that, um, you know, we started with all in-person training primarily because when the program started, um, the technology hadn't really caught up to us. But now it has, and the, our volunteers' access to that technology is getting much, much better, and their comfort level with it is becoming much, much better. Um, we're still... Um, in requiring face-to-face -face training, um, but we are supplementing that with videos, with um, uh, online kind of refreshers and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I have some concern regarding uh, only doing online training for invasive species plant identification just because of what we have seen with our volunteers, even when they do a classroom training, it's different than being out in the field and actually touching the fresh plants and pulling it up out of the water. And so when we go out there in the field with them, that's where we really see the confidence and the comfort level shoot 
way up. And so um, I can see, you know, definitely it helps to have something that they can go and watch at their own time to kind of remind themselves of the differences between the different plants and so forth. But just for our experience working with the volunteers, there's really no substitute for the um, field-based training. Yeah, I'll echo that. We've heard that from our volunteers as well, that they really they like fact sheets and videos and things like that, but they say there is no substitute for you coming out to our lake and actually showing us what we have. That's the most valuable thing for them. Yeah, yeah I can echo that too. And I think we, uh, many of us might remember what it was like to take that plant ID class in college, and then when you get out there in the field, you're looking at and thinking, Oh my God, it looks no nothing like it did in the classroom. So I think the field and um, hands-on um, workshops are required as well. Great, thank you. And I, I noticed, I think Danny just left the room, but uh, I'm sorry, there's one more question before that. Um, Lois asked about EdMaps and Missin. Uh, is there any chance that and Maps and Missin can get together and merge their data. I can comment on that. Um, there's a chance, um, but from my understanding, and this conversation has happened over and over, um, and there's other databases as well, and it would be beautiful if they could all um, kind of become one, and, and uh, a lot of state and regional programs are using the EdMaps platform, which is great. Uh, here in Michigan, we have um, kind of made the decision that MISSIN will be the, the database of choice for invasive species information. Um, and those two programs don't talk really well to one another. Um, and so, you know, there will be a need for, um, you know, some technology work to get them to talk to one another and bring that data together. And some of that is being done, um, but I think it's still kind of in the, in the trial phases. So, yeah, that would, be a, that would be an ideal future scenario, in my opinion. Nice to have, would be nice to have. Uh, okay, uh, Danny's question now, are the boats uh, treated, uh, I assume he's talking about the boats that do these inspections for aquatic invasive species, are the boats treated once they leave the lake after an inspection? If not, um, the very inspectors might be spreading the problem because they're going to so many lakes. So any, any thoughts from our presenters about that observation? Hi, this is Erin. Um, I'm just reading this question to make sure I understand. Um, well, our inspectors um, stand at the boat landing, so um, ideally they would not be able to be transporting any aquatic invasive species themselves since they won't have um, boats or trailers or things, but even so, um, if for, you know, monitoring, that might be a good question with, with Paul and the, the folks we have with the Department of Natural Resources that do routine lake monitoring on maybe more than one lake during the day. And they do have, um, for the Department of Natural Resources staff and our AIS staff, there's decontamination um, uh, lists to follow and um, prevention steps that they, they do take. Um, but for just our inspectors who are talking to citizens who are boating and angling um, boats, are not all treated before leaving a lake. Um, they're asked to drain all their water, and there are a few boat wash stations, but not very many um, that we have here in Wisconsin. Other states, any comments? I can just quickly comment, you know, again, trying to interpret the question a little bit. If they're uh, concerned about the volunteer monitors that may be spreading species from one lake to another, if they're out there uh, surveying in one spot or another, what I find is that um, two things. First of all, when we do our training, we do talk about that um, with our volunteers. But in most cases, at least in Michigan, our volunteers are lakefront property owners on the lake that they're surveying. And so they're, they're um, their boat is in its home lake when they're out there doing the work, and they're not moving from one lake to another. They're, they're focusing on the lake that they live on. As far as Minnesota goes, we are, um, in our training, we're having some, um, e having education on um, cleanup of tools and things that people are using and what they should be doing and how they should be doing that. Um, and a lot of our people may not be going out on boats. 
Um, that isn't the thing we're stressing. Um, because it's a, we're approaching it a little differently, I think, than the other states. When they're doing um, lake inspections and things, though, then yeah, they will be going out on boats, but um, and we'll have to be addressing that in our protocols. And we we have boat and um, we have guidelines in Minnesota as well as boat inspectors on many lakes too. Great, thanks, know. Eleanor. Yeah. And I'll just uh, Angela has a comment about the the databases there about Glances potentially combining both um, Missin and EdMaps data. Um, I'm going to uh, let our presenters comment on that in the chat box if they would like to, uh, because I'm going to move to the end of our webinar here. So thank you all for, for participating. And thanks to our presenters. Got a lot of great information out in a short period of time. And contact information for all of them, I think, uh, for you to be able to contact them after this webinar if you uh, would like more information from any of them. Uh, this webinar, will you'll be able to access this webinar in a week or so on, on the northcentralwater.org website or learn.eextension.org. Um, so feel free to share it with folks if you, if you know people that might be interested in the information. Our next webinar is about uh, effective science communication. And we've got another couple great presenters. They have a little bit longer uh, presentation time, 15 minutes or so each. Uh, Kristen Rundy uh, from the University of Wisconsin Extension, who's done a lot of work on communication framing and science communication in uh, behavior change. And Michael Dahlstrom from Iowa State University, who um, has also done a lot of work on science communication and the use of narrative and storytelling in science communication. So uh, another two great presentations to look forward to in February. Thank you very much. Um, for joining, and uh, we look forward to uh, he hearing you uh, participate in future webinars. Have a good afternoon, everyone.